morning by my family. Happy Sunday to you. Uh, this is the Lord's day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing, and we're going to be glad in it. Amen. So, so happy that you tuned in. Once again, just want to thank you, even though it was a few weeks ago. It was just awesome, first of all, to see so many people out for pastor, Pastor's birthday. You know, that was the main thing, having all of us together as a family. And the participation was really close to 100%. We had uh, a very large percentage of the membership, uh, the partners here, uh, enjoying the presence of God, enjoying one another uh, like we haven't in quite some time. So I just want to salute you and thank you once again for first showing up and then showing out in your support of the man of God and uh, did a great job honoring him. And he's still happy, still overjoyed over that. And we know God is happy. Uh, we did something that is outlined in the word of God as a principle that blesses the man of God, it blesses us, and also it blesses God. It's something that he welcomes and he delights in. And so we know the Lord is happy. So we want to continue uh, serving the Lord. We want to continue learning the word, getting closer to God, and completing the assignment as the body of Christ that the Lord Jesus has commissioned and anointed us to do. Amen. How many of you know we're laborers together with him? Glory to God. So saying that, let's go ahead and get started with today's service. And we always start off with tithes and offerings. And uh, don't have a new scripture for you today, but a very significant scripture uh, in light of what we're going through, uh, really globally. So you guessed it. Let's turn over to Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. And uh, let's see what the Lord says. And let's obey the Lord and be in expectation for what the Lord says he'll do as a result of us. Uh, acting and obeying his word. Amen? So we'll start at verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income, into the storehouse, that there may be food or resources in my house, and prove me now by it, by the tithe. This is the only thing that we can prove God with, is us bringing the tithe. He gives us the opportunity to prove him, to see if what he says is true. And we know that God can't lie. So everything God says is true. As it pertains to us, when God is speaking to us, he always speaks the truth, but it's up to us whether or not we experience the truth that he speaks. Amen. And we're, gonna, we're going to obey God and experience the truth that he speaks to us in this scripture. Amen. So prove me now by it, by the tithe, says the Lord of hosts. Number one, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, uh, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God, as a result of us giving 10% of our income, just 10%, he, he uh, allows us to keep 90, and out of that 90, he allows us to, to decide uh, how much we should give in terms of our offering. But 10% gives us access to God's heavenly resources. Those resources are our greatest need. Um, the need for heavenly resources has always been the same. But there's times where it's more apparent to us because uh, you and I, we're human. Uh, we, although we're born again, we have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. We have the Word of God. Uh, but we can get in the flesh. You know, and our flesh uh, serves as a hindrance to us applying the Word of God, obeying God, our flesh causes us to be forgetful. Our flesh causes us to doubt. So those are the things that we contend with as believers. So, you know, that's why we, can, we need to go over the, the scriptures, you know, over and over again, over and over again. And we need to hear the word of God on a constant and continual basis so that we maintain our motivation. We maintain uh, our dedication to God. Amen. So it says, again, prove me now, now by it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So those heavenly resources are perpetual, 
Other, otherwise, we would have room to receive them. But since they're perpetual, uh, they're you know eternal, and they're not just tangible, uh, we don't have enough room to contain it. God wants to be our supply. Excuse me, and you can see that in his promise with regard to the tithe. God wants to be a continual supply to us. He doesn't just want to supply us every now and then. He wants to be God. He is God. But he wants to be God in the lives, in the individual lives of his people. And in order for him to be God, we have to obey him. And one of the primary ways or areas of obedience, especially uh, when, it, when it comes to us proving him, when it comes to us putting God to the test, there's only one area that we can do that, and that is the tithe. Amen. Now, verse 11, he says, I will rebuke the devourer. Uh, and, 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 and in brackets here, the parentheses, it says, well, those are brackets, and the amplified, it says, insects and plagues. We're in a time of, uh, of plague, uh, COVID-19. You know, now... Um, They've come out with a new variant. Um, you know, the, there's more fear uh, being propagated. Um, these are the times, again, where God's heavenly resources or our need for God's heavenly resources, our need for God's help are more apparent to us. There's never a time, uh, as long as we're under the as long as we're on this earth, that we don't need God. We need God every second of every day. And that'll be throughout all of eternity. It's just that when we get to, to heaven, we won't have to contend with the enemy. Uh, everything will be perfect the way God created it. But while we're on this earth, we're always going to need God's help. We're always going to need God's protection. And the thing about this earth earth realm and these bodies that we live in, it causes us to be susceptible to deception. And uh, sometimes, you know, when, when things are good, we can be deceived into thinking that we don't need God, but we need God all the time. You know, this is the valley of the shadow of death, even when that death, that destruction that's present isn't noticeable. When it's not apparent, it's still there. Amen. There's threats. 24-7, 365. Amen? So, in, in these times, you know, the need for God's protection is apparent, but we have a promise to even cover us um, and protect us from this virus. I don't care what variant it is, because you know this is not going to be the last thing that comes. So, but when we tithe, when we tithe, as a lifestyle. And when we tithe in faith. How do I tithe in faith? I speak the word of God. As it pertains to tithe. To the tithe. I put Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. In my mouth. So that it's in my heart. And when it's in my heart in abundance. And I speak it out. The power of God is released. And we'll see that very scripture that very word that contains the power, power of God working on our behalf. Amen. So don't just write out a check. Write out your check or, you know, input your amount on the screen if you're doing your uh, tithing online. If you're putting cash in the envelope, do that, but follow that up with a confession of faith. Declare, let's declare it now. Say, Father, with the tithe today, I prove you. I trust you, and I prove you. I put your word to the test, and I'm going to tithe today declaring that COVID-19 will not come near me or my family because you rebuke the devourer. You rebuke this plague on my behalf, and I rebuke it so that I'm in line with your will. So, say this after me. COVID-19, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. COVID-19, 
The Lord rebukes you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're tithing today. We're taking 10% of our income and we're returning it to God because it belongs to him. And when we do that, we're, we're going to continue to keep his word in our mouth and walk by faith. We have authority. We release our God-given authority through speaking his word. Amen. So we're going to exercise faith and our authority over this plague. We're also backed by God rebuking the plague for us. And when God tells the plague, hey, stop, no more, that plague is doing exactly what God tells it to do. Amen. So let's go on to offerings. Now in Malachi, it also talked about offerings. It says, it talked about the people robbing God, and they asked God the question, well, wherein have we robbed you? God said, in tithes and in offerings. Why did he say that? Because you, if you're not tithing, it's impossible for you to give an offering. You have to tithe first, and anything over and above the tithe is considered an offering. Amen. So now let's look at offerings. And the word of God has gone out, and we continue to look at the word, that the preceding word over this ministry in this time. And we find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. That's the preceding word. But let's start at uh, verse 6, just for the sake of continuity. Verse 6 says, remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. One thing about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God as is, is as if a man should cast seed in the ground. So God puts you in control of your harvest. God puts you in control of the quality of your life. God puts you in control of how much you receive. If you sow sparingly, that's how you're going to reap. Amen. Then it goes on to say, And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to someone. That's your motive. Our motive has to be our love for God and other people. And when we give, we want to give. Our, our target is blessing other people. And when we do that, when, we do, when we're generous with the motive of being a blessing to someone else, will also reap generously and with blessings. So all we have to do, our main concern has to be, number one, to, to a purpose in our hearts to be generous so that other people are blessed by our generosity. When we do that, when we're generous and our heart is in our giving, it is impossible for us not to reap abundantly. Amen. Verse 8, and, and then it says, uh, well, let's go to verse 7. It gives us some more instructions with regard to how we should give. It says, let each one give as he's made up in his own mind. God has given us uh, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is to be a blessing. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave. The mind of Christ is to be a blessing. Jesus literally gave everything he had to us. Amen. And that mind is operating in us. So we as believers, we have the mind and we have the heart of God. And if we yield to the mind and the heart of God, we too will be givers. We won't just give, but that will literally be us. It's a part of the divine nature. And, and, our, and our destiny as believers is to is to uh, yield to that divine nature to the point where it's the, the life of Christ, the nature of Christ, that literally lives in and through us. And we no longer live by our own will and by our own sinful human nature. Amen. That is the goal for us to be a witness, for us to, to produce evidence of the life of Christ. One of the ways that happens is through us operating in generosity and benevolence. Amen. 
So let each one give as he's made up in his own mind, purpose in his heart, not reluctantly, sorrowfully or under compulsion or under pressure. For God loves, he takes pleasure in prizes above other things and is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. God won't abandon or do without. He refuses to abandon or do without someone who's a prompt to do it giver and their heart is in their giving. God, the Father, is not on this earth. He lives on the inside of you and I through his spirit. And if people are going to experience God in this earth realm, they have to experience God in and through us. Amen. And when we are givers, we give God an avenue, an avenue whereby people can experience God himself. Why? Because God is a giver. Amen. And when God has someone operating in union and in fellowship with him, God can operate through that person so that those in the world who don't know God can have personal experience with God through us, his children, through us, the believer. And when that happens, God is able to make all grace, every favor, how we've been saying that here. We've been saying all kinds of favor. That's what we're believing for. We're believing for that when we give. In particular, in particular, those of you who have been participating and will participate in the favor challenge. Now, we, we have been challenging 50 people to sow $50 over and above your regular tithes and offerings, but that 50 people is not limited. That doesn't limit the number of people. That's just a goal. So if you want to be included in the favor challenge, I mean, all of us can do it, and all of us should do it with the expectation of God showing us all kinds of favor. Amen. So let's read that one more time. God is able to make all grace, every favor, or all kinds of favor, and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances, and whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support, furnish in abundance. Why? for every good work and chari charitable donation. Amen. So our, our goal, once again, as the people of God, as God's sons, is to be generous. Amen. To be a blessing to others. So uh, take time to prepare your, your tithe, your offering, your partnership, your favorite seed. While you're doing that, I'm just going to take a quick moment to remind you of the different options. Uh, we have four options that we made available to you in which you can uh, return the tithe and sow your various offerings. Number one, you can log on to vinelifechristianfellowship.com and do your giving online. Number two, you can mail in your tithes, your offerings, your uh, partnership, and your uh, favorite challenge. The uh, address to the ministry is located at the bottom of your screen in the description box. Number three, uh, a staff member or members will be here until uh, 12 noon this afternoon to receive your tithes and offerings in person. And if those three options don't work for you, you can always give us a call here at the ministry and we'll arrange for you, uh, for someone to come. Uh, most likely it's gonna be myself and my wife, Robin, will come to your, your place of uh, residence and make sure that your gifts are returned to the ministry safely and securely. Amen. Once again, I want to thank you so much for your generosity, your support. In these challenging times, we've been able to continue to go forward. And God is appreciative. And look for God to show you all kinds of favor. Look for God to rebuke this plague for you. And... Um, we're going to see the faithfulness of God until Jesus returns. Glory to God. Amen. All right. So, once again, thank you for giving. And we're going to continue along with our service. And it's time for the message. I'll give you a moment or two to get your Bible. When you have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, and we'll make it our, our confession of faith, and we'll begin our lesson there. 
Amen. First Peter chapter four. Let's make our confession of faith. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. First uh, Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And I believe you had time enough to locate that scripture. So let's begin reading. It says, but the end and culmination. Everybody say that word with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Culmination. Let's say it two more times. Culmination. Culmination. Now, we know uh, Dr. Wilkes has been uh, given the assignment of teaching eternal life. Eternal life has a foundation, it has an application, and it has a culmination. We're going to be talking about the culmination of eternal life. And just as a quick review, we know the foundation of eternal life uh, is found in 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning at verse 17. Um, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy, instructed the believers to, to give, uh, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, and in that way, they would lay up a good foundation for the time to come so that they can ultimately lay hold of eternal life. Amen. We know that when the rich young ruler approached Jesus and inquired about eternal life, Jesus gave him several instructions, one of those being sell what you have and give to the poor. So Jesus directed the rich young ruler uh, to lay a foundation by giving, lay the foundation of eternal life by giving to the poor. The Apostle Paul also, in his letter to the Galatian church, uh, verse in, in uh, chapter 6, verse 8, he says that when you sow to the Spirit, and in that context, he's very clear what sowing to the Spirit entails. Number one, giving to the man, man of God, and get, you know, being a ministry partner. Number two, uh, giving finances to other believers. And number three, blessing uh, others, all people, financially. When you do that, you're sowing to the Spirit. And the harvest, what you reap from sowing to the Spirit, is eternal life. Amen. So that's the foundation. The application of eternal life is simply this. Us believers uh, uh, arriving at the place by the power of God where it's no longer we who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. Amen. And then, which brings us to today's topic, the culmination of eternal life. So I'm going to read 1 Peter 4 and 7 one more time. But the end and culmination of all things has now come near. Now we know he's talking about the last days. So, we're supposed to keep sound-minded, self-restrained, and alert. Therefore, the practice of prayer. So, the practice of, of prayer, which is what keeps us of a sound mind, uh, helps us exercise restraint or temperance, and keeps us alert. Amen. So, we need to do all of those by the practice of prayer in these last days. Amen. Now, turn over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And we're going to see what the Bible, or how the Bible defines the culmination of eternal life. You know, we're talking about eternal life as it pertains to life on this planet, in these bodies. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And I believe you have it. It says, awaiting and looking for the fulfillment, the realization of our blessed hope. Our blessed hope. So, our blessed hope is our expectation, our ultimate expectation as believers. That's our blessed hope. So that would be the culmination. Culmination, the uh, synonym that I like the best, that I feel that best describes that word culmination, is climax or apex, the highest point. So we have, a, we have an expectation, we have a goal as believers, the ultimate goal, what is the climax of 
our life on this earth? What is the climatic point? What are we looking forward to? Well, Titus is very specific. He says, awaiting and looking for the fulfillment, the realization of the fulfillment, fulfillment would also be the culmination uh, of our blessed hope, even the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Amen. That's the culmination of eternal life. It is the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, more commonly referred to as the rapture of the church. Um, I don't have this on my notes, but I'm feeling led to go there. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And give me just a second. I want to look at one more scripture. Yep. Okay. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. Now the Apostle Paul starts by saying, But relative to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and this is, this is the culmination of eternal life right here, and our gathering together to meet him, our gathering together to meet him, we beg you, brother, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled, or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed, whether it be by some pretend revelation of the, of the spirit or by word or by letter alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. So apparently uh, there was some false teaching, uh, some rumors, um, some deception that was being presented to the, the, the church at Thessalonica um, saying that the Lord had already appeared. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to clear that up. Now verse 3, he says, let no one deceive or beguile you. Now, in, in our prior teaching last week, we talked about deception. Jesus, that was his warning, his number one warning to us with regard to to the last days. He said, let no man deceive you, leading you astray. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But if there's, if there's one uh, word to describe the climate of these last days, that one word would be deception. So let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. For that day, talking about the rapture, will not come except the apostasy comes first. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked, but uh, verse 3 is very controversial uh, because of this word apostasy. And uh, if you go to the original Greek, it's the word apostasia. Now, most people, I won't say most people, but let's just say for, for, for the purpose of this teaching, you have uh, two different beliefs, and they're based on how you interpret that word. Well, the Bible says that let every word out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Another way of saying that is you let the word of God uh, interpret itself. So you interpret scripture with scripture. Now, if you go back up to verse 1, it says, But relative to, our, to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and our gathering together to meet him, Hold your place in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Matter of fact, let's, let's, let's start at verse 16. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, 
with the shout of an arch archangel and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and those who have departed this life in Christ will rise first. Then we, the living ones who remain on the earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected, re with the res resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now there's very little debate whether or not 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17 is talking about the rapture. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 the Apostle Paul says, but relative to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and our gathering together to meet him. Where do we meet him? This is not talking about us meeting him on the earth. It's talking about us who are alive being caught up to meet him in the air. We just read that. So let's see if the way verse 3 is translated, lines up with 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 16 and 17 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, which talk about this meeting that we, the church and the Lord, have in the clouds. Amen. It says, let no one deceive you or beguile you in any way, for that day will not come except the apostasy, which means falling away, comes first. Now, here's how it's translated in the Amplified. It says, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come and the man uh, uh, of lawlessness, sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom of perdition? So that's talking about, they translated that word apostasia as believers departing from the faith. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17 the apostle Paul is not talking about believers departing from the faith. He's talking about believers departing from the earth. Amen. So if we interpret scripture with scripture, it's plain and simple to see that that word apostasy or departure or falling away is talking about us leaving the earth, not leaving the faith. Now, anybody who's living in these times can see that there is a departure from the faith. A lot of believers are departing from the faith. But us the believers departing from the faith does not make way for the Antichrist to be revealed. It's us. And it's going to say that in the next verse. Let no one deceive you. I'll read verse 3 again. Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way. For that day the rapture will not come except the apostasy, the departure or the final way comes first. And, and I'll go right down to verse 4 talking about the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against or over all that is called God or that is worship, even is actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Now, Daniel prophesied about that in Daniel chapter 9. Jesus also prophesied about that in uh, Matthew 24. And, and it's going to happen. It's also in Revelation. It's going to happen. The, the Antichrist is actually going to enter into the temple of God, set up his headquarters, and at mid-tribulation, he's going to announce to the world that he is God. Amen. But the Antichrist, his identity will remain concealed until the church is taken out of, out of the way. Now, Verse 5, he says, Do you not recollect, recollect that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Well, we just saw his first letter 
to the Thessalonian church where he was talking about the rapture in great detail in chapter 4. And now you know what is restraining him. Who is him? The Antichrist from being revealed at this time. It is so that he may be manifested, revealed in his own appointed time. Now, who is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed? Well, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit lives in us. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. The body of Christ is the restraining force in the earth. Now, where the, the, the very fact, well, Peter said it this way. He, he talked about scoffers and how they would, would mock and say, where is the promise of his coming? They've been saying that forever, and he's not here yet. But the apostle Peter reveals that what some count for slackness is really God exercising long-suffering, not to the world, but to us, the church. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish. And we, the church, are commissioned. We're commissioned to bring in the fullness of the Gentiles. Once that has happened, our assignment is done, and there's no need for us in the earth realm anymore. So the Holy Spirit will remove the church after the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. But until that time, God is restraining. He's holding back because he's exercising long-suffering toward us. Once we're gone, you're, you're going to see immediately what the Bible refers to in Revelation chapter 6 as his wrath or the wrath of the Lamb. Because when, once the Antichrist is revealed, Jesus is now opening six seals that only he can open. And those six seals are his wrath. Amen. And we'll look at that if we have enough time today. Amen. So let's go back over to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, Awaiting and looking for the fulfillment, the realization of our blessed hope. Our blessed hope is the rapture. That's the culmination of eternal life. Now, uh, let's talk about the culmination of eternal life. Let's talk about the rapture. Amen. There's two things that are very important for us as believers to know about the rapture. What purpose does it serve? Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 23. If this is the climax of eternal life, the culmination, if this is the apex, if this, if this is our blessed hope, our number one expectation as believers, we need to know what purpose it serves. Amen. Why is this such a blessed hope? Romans 8, verse 23. It says, and not only the creation, but we ourselves too, we have and enjoy the first fruits of the Holy Spirit a foretaste of the blissful things to come. So these blissful things, are, that's what we're hoping for. These blissful things are the culmination of eternal life. Then it says, we groan inwardly as we wait for the redemption of our bodies. So the rapture is the redemption of our bodies. The Apostle Paul goes into that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. The, the rapture, the culmination of eternal life. One of the purpose, one of the purposes of the rapture is us receiving the redemption of our bodies. That's one of the blissful things that we're groaning in expectation for. The redemption of our bodies. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Take notice. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth. 
an event decreed by hidden purpose or counsel of God. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed, transformed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump. For a trumpet will sound in the dead in Christ. Now when it says the dead in Christ, it's talking about the bodies of the dead in Christ. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, I believe, gives a description. It talks about the dead in Christ. And it refers to them as the spirits of just men made perfect. Amen. So when you die as a believer, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Your body remains here on, on earth and it decays, but at, the, at that last trump, those who have died, their bodies will be glorified and, they, and, and they'll be reunited. The dead in Christ will reunite with those glorified bodies in the air. That, that's just awesome in and of itself. I mean, that's worth waiting for. That, that's something that we should be in great expectation for. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, call for a trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, free, and immune from decay. That's bliss. That's ultimate bliss. The dead in Christ will receive their glorified bodies. Those bodies are immune from decay. Imperishable. And we shall be changed, transformed. For this perishable part of us must put on the imperishable nature. And this mortal part of us, this nature that is capable of dying, must put on immortality, freedom from death. And when this perishable puts on imperishable, and this that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death, then shall be fulfilled the scripture that says, death is swallowed up, utterly vanquished, forever, in and unto victory. Death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Now, listen, listen to this and get a hold of this. Now, sin is the sting of death, and sin exercises its power upon the soul through the abuse of the law. Sin is the sting of death. When these corruptible bodies put on incorruption, and when these mortal bodies put on immortality, that means that our bodies have been redeemed from the curse of sin. Since our bodies are redeemed from the curse of sin, they're no longer subject to temptation. So our, our life of sinning, our life of being subject to temptation ends immediately. Amen. We're, we're under the influence, we're under the sole influence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, from the time of rapture throughout all of eternity, we will only manifest perfection. Imperfection will no longer be a reality to us. Just think about that. No more imperfection. No more, no more liability to temptation. Oh my God. The blessed hope, the culmination of eternal life. Glory to God. Amen. That's, that, that is just exciting. That is just exciting. And that's going to happen. That can happen any day now. Any day now. Any day now. These bodies could be changed. That's the end of death. That's the end of sin. That's the end of temptation. That's the end of us manifesting imperfection. That means there'll, no, there'll be no more anxiety. No more sadness. No more hate. No more resentment. No more unforgiveness. No more worry. No more negative emotions. Our life will be consistent only. It will consist only of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith and faithfulness, temperance. The fruit of the Spirit will be our reality. All the time. Amen.
And then, I mean, you can, the benefits are, are just innumerable. Glory to God. Now, in light, in light of this blessed hope, in light of a culmination of eternal life, Jesus makes a statement here, Matthew, Matthew 24. Turn over there to Matthew 24. We're going to read verse 4, and we're going to read it in light of the culmination of eternal life. It says, Jesus answered them, be careful that no one misleads you, deceiving you, and leading you into error. Leading you into error. Well, in light of the blessed hope, the culmination of eternal life, what the, the reward that God has laid up for all of us, in light of that, Jesus warns us of deception. Why? Because deception serves the purpose of misleading us. Misleading us in an attempt to get us to miss out on the culmination of eternal life. That's what the devil is doing in these last days. He doesn't want believers to experience the blessed hope, nor does he want believers to influence non-believers to become believers in an attempt to get them uh, to miss out on the blessed hope. That's what, that's, that's the point to everything that's going on right now. All of the deception that is being presented in these times is for that purpose, to mislead people so that they miss out on the culmination of all things. Because the alternative, the alternative is the wrath of the Lamb. The alternative is the wrath of the Lamb. Now, turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this scripture states something that's so obvious, but as obvious as, as this scripture is, in its intent, and as clear as what it's saying, many people are deceived and disregard the scripture. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For it says, For God hath not appointed us to incur, what's that next word? His, his wrath. Now, how, how hard is that to believe? If God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son, so that we can believe on him and receive eternal life. Why would God do that in order to appoint us to his wrath? One of the, one of the reasons God sent Jesus to save us, one of the aspects of that salvation is salvation from his wrath. You, as a parent, don't uh, appoint your children to your wrath, especially if it's going to uh, end or result in their eternal damnation. Of course not. Well, God loves us much more than any parent loves their child. And he has not appointed us to his wrath. It says it right there. He did not select us to condemn us, but that we might obtain his salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If salvation, if we obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, why would God appoint us to the wrath of Jesus Christ? Therefore, he's ordained for us to be participants in the rapture. Amen. Amen. Given that, you know the devil wants the opposite. He wants to deceive us, to lead us astray, so that we miss out on that blessed hope. Now, we only have a minute, so uh, next time we'll, we'll go over to Revelation 6 and we'll see the wrath of the Lamb in great detail. And, you know, you can read that for yourself and then, you know, when we come together again, uh, you'll be familiar with those scriptures. 
But the reason for reading, it, reading this is to motivate us to stay on course uh, so that we make it to our destination and so that we encourage others to join us in that blessed hope, in that culmination of eternal life, the culmination of all things. Amen? So look forward to seeing you uh, Tuesday. Make sure that you t tune in. And better yet, make sure that you're here at the campus at 10 o'clock at morning Bible study. And if 10 o'clock doesn't work for you, then come at 7. And we'll continue along these lines. But it's time. The day is approaching. And it's time for us to assemble ourselves together even more faithfully. Amen. Let me declare the word of God over you as it pertains to your protection in these last days. Amen. And we'll end the service with that. I declare that no evil shall befall you. No plague shall come nigh your dwelling. I declare that the Lord has given his angels charge over you and that they bear you up in their hands lest you dash your foot against a stone. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. You are God's child and you're not appointed to wrath. Your life is redeemed from destruction. I pray that the Lord keep you to the day of his return. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And again, look forward to seeing you here Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock or Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you. For more information on Vine Life Christian Fellowship, please visit our website at www.vinelifechristianfellowship.com. Options concerning the tithe, offerings, partnership, or favor challenge are located in the description box below. It is our hope that you have been blessed and enlightened by this message. As we begin our online journey, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel ensuring that you will not miss future messages. On behalf of Vine Life Christian Fellowship, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next time.